quick question before we get started. How many people this is your first OWASP event? Yeah, wow, that's fantastic. Fantastic, yeah. And how many people here are pen testers? How many people here are developers? Okay, fantastic. And then C-level stakeholders, managers, couple. Okay. Nice. I think Jim was all of those. <laughs> So we can go ahead and start streaming. So then we're going to go ahead and start streaming out this class, or not this class, sorry. This, uh, this presentation hopefully will give those of you who are just starting to get into mobile development and you're thinking, well, what do I need to worry about but in terms of security? Hopefully this will put some things in perspective. Because it is a little bit frustrating. In fact, this presentation was born out of almost everything else in my life, extreme frustration, right? You go and explain these things to various people day and day and and just like you guys know the security world, the development world, just the world in general, it tends to be to these extremes, right? There are some people who say, oh, you know what, it's fine, we outsource it, we're just going to put it out there, it's good, right? There's that extreme. And there's like the other extreme that are like, well, my online catalog, I went ahead and I put in um, anti-jailbreaking detection software or anything else, it's like overkill, right? It's like, you know, it's like the US military. They got you know ten times more military than anybody else and they just keep throwing things at it. So you can find yourself on either one of these extremes. You guys agree with that or no? The only thing we think about OWASP is it's so extreme here, right? It's all <laughs> so Oh yeah, microphone? Do I need a microphone? Can you guys hear me okay? Can everybody hear me okay? So my name is Jerry Hoff. I'm an OWASP volunteer. I work at White Hat Security. I've worked at this, these various companies, White Hat, Morgan Stanley, Aspect, Lehman Brothers, and Washington University. So I've kind of had experience, at least dipped my toe, into almost every type of person that comes to one of these events. Academia, professional developer, pen tester, code reviewer. Uh, I worked in I'm Morgan Stanley helping to set policy and look at applications, acted as a gatekeeper and now I'm a vendor. So I got all those different uh, badges. As for OWASP, probably my most well-known thing is the AppSec tutorial series. It's only four videos, they're 10 minutes long, but somehow they seem to be quite popular. Got about a quarter million views. Um, the last couple years of my life have just been crazy, but now I'm trying to get back into making some of those. So I'm collaborating with the great Simon Bennett on, uh, on the next one will be coming out hopefully shortly. I put Tom and Jerry up here because people always take my first name and my last name, Jerry Hoff, and they kind of like merge it together. So they're like Jeff or something, right? It's like, but it's not, it's Jerry. Just think of like Tom and Jerry. Okay, so, oh yeah, one other thing I want to mention. This presentation was originally written for the OWASP Japan, right, which was earlier in the year. And, um, I got most of the it, the, it was originally in Japanese, and I got most of the Japanese out, but when the screenshots and stuff like that, they're still in Japanese, but that's not relevant. Don't say, is there a hidden meeting here, or is it like only Japanese Google does this? No, it's just completely circumstantial to the presentation. Okay, so speaking of my frustration, okay, um, this is what I've observed, and I checked with Google to see if there was some validity to this concern. A lot of my clients, have now started to come to us and say, mobile, mobile. It's all about mobile. We need more mobile security. We're really you know, upset about the way our developers are developing mobile applications. And that's, you could say that that's valid. But I happen, you know, especially with clients and with you know, other organizations I've done consulting with, I know that the server side is not up to par. It's not optimum. It's not anything that could be considered robust. But yet now there's all this focus on the device itself. Have you guys noticed stuff like this before, potentially? Everybody's worried about this device. Personally, I think there might be a psychological aspect to it. So you, for a non-developer, I think this, is, this thing is like crackling or something. But for the non-developer, it's hard to understand web servers and databases. And like the average executive just thinks that's all magic, right? But the phone is something they can hold in their, their hand. They, they take it with them to bed. They wake up in the morning with it. So it's something tangible. 
So then you start to focus as if this security on this phone, the points on this phone, somehow supersede that onto the server. That was my observation, anecdotal. But I checked you know, on uh, Google Trends, and you can clearly see that, again, this is not scientific, but web security, the number of searches are actually going down over time. But mobile security, you can see that comparatively, the searches for mobile security are much higher than web security. Is that justified? What do you guys think? Is it justified? Equal? And mostly BS. That's pretty much the, this talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've got you've got one camp that says, yeah, the device is you know the code that's running on the device is potentially introducing more risk to an organization. One camp would say. You know, the server side and the mobile device, they're both adding the same amount of risk. And then there's some people who say, well, most of the risk is on the server side. So this code is, I mean, sorry, this presentation, I'm going to be going with what my thoughts on this issue are. You are free to disagree. This is not like a lecture where I sit up here and talk. Disagree, you can make it as interactive as you want, okay? So a lot of the talks that I give, um, you know, other talks tend to be extremely high level or theoretical. I try to make mine very practical. And if you think that, you know, you've got a different experience or you want to offer something else, feel free to do so. Okay, so again, where is the risk? Why is this an important question? The reason why it's an important question is because we only, and this is what we were talking about before, the phone versus the web server, we only have so much time and money to spend on security. This is one of the fallacies that I think we tend to, as, an, as a, as a community of security professionals tend to devolve into. I mean, when I was a consultant, I used to say, we need to fix every vulnerability. It has to happen, right? Then I worked at a bank where they had 1,500 web applications and hundreds of thousands of known vulnerabilities, and then you start getting taken aback saying, okay, there's no way we can fix all this. At a certain point, you have to accept some amount of risk, okay? As painful as that is for the people who charge by the hour to hear, you have to wind up accepting some risk. And that's just a state of, of, of life, right? We accept risk in all areas of our life. So where do we invest our time and the money, and what proportion do we put on which side? So first of all, let's set the stage, not to be overly pedantic, but um, obviously when we're talking about mobile devices, we're talking about tablets, we're talking about phones, we're talking about watches, we're talking about things that are, that are designed to, uh, to uh, go into mobile devices and normally be carried around with individuals on a daily basis. So that includes you know, all that you see above here. Um, anybody have a Windows phone? What do you think? Fantastic, Fantastic yeah. Oh, you got the t-shirt. Well, you guys work at Microsoft? Oh, okay, good, yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting. This, Microsoft is in a position, potentially, since they don't already have a huge consumer base, right? So if they went for, um, you know, it's very hard to sell security to consumers, one could argue, right? But if you start going after more uh, business-oriented, then security all of a sudden may become more of a higher selling feature. So they're kind of in a pull position to potentially pull something like that off and build a more secure uh, environment to run applications. Again, that's all just speculation, but interesting. Anybody still use BlackBerry, or are they just completely, completely go oh, one holdout, yeah? <laughs> How does that feel when you go to like the BlackBerry app store and there's like two things in there? Playing Snake? <laughs> no, joking, 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 joking. They're gonna make a, they're gonna come back, they're gonna come back. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> they're gonna come back. Okay, so you guys know the basics. Again, I have, to, I have to state this because you would think that everybody knows these things, but very frequently people send these presentations and they're not quite sure. There are multiple ways to build web applications, okay? Some people, I mean, even I, I hear professional developers go, oh, yeah, 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 I know, it's Objective-C, or yeah, yeah, I know, it's, it's this, or it's that. But there's actually several different ways that you can build mobile applications. So what are they? What are some ways that you can build mobile applications that you can then submit to an app store? Yep, so you can use just plain HTML5, you can pull out a web container, stick the whole thing in there, absolutely. And what else? You can use PhoneGap, which is a really, we're gonna talk about that in a second, it's kind of a hybrid, where you basically have a JavaScript API wrappers over the API of the phone, you invoke it using JavaScript. Does that sound safe to everybody, invoking like native phone APIs with JavaScript? Awesome. Yeah, I love it, right? Gets me some warm and fuzzies, okay. 
And then obviously you've got um, languages such as Objective-C, Java. In, in, Andro in, in Android devices, what languages can you use? Any cloud which you get the JVM, which is like hundreds of languages. Right, and then you can actually circumvent the JVM by using C++. So there's an SDK for C++ with Android as well. For iOS, what languages are at your disposal? Objective-C, this is why we have to go over these, and what? Swift. Swift is a brand new language that was just introduced by Apple, what, a few weeks ago? I'm already seeing ads like on job sites saying searching for Swift developers must have three years experience, right? <laughs> have you guys seen that stuff? I don't know. Okay. So yeah, you guys got them all. So those are the different ways you can build. You obviously have thick clients. What would be one thing to take in mind if you're looking at thick client versus web? I mean, what would be like a few of the risks that would jump out at you immediately that would be present in one and not the other? Yeah, let me back up. Actually, we're gonna get to it in a second. But the question simply is, if you use thick client controls as opposed to web controls, does that make a difference in the security model? XSS, absolutely, right? So, I mean, that's the, the big one that would jump out. Um, if you're not using HTML and you're not using JavaScript, the likelihood of XSS popping is probably diminished. Okay, uh, so then we're going through these different, um, these different technologies, and then we have Firefox Phone. Anybody have one of these? Not yet, not yet. I was in the subway in Germany a couple months ago, and they had, like, advertisements you know, in there, which kind of confused me because the Firefox team has told me before that it's mainly for, like, third world and stuff like that. So I wasn't sure what was going on. But, um, you yeah, know, Firefox is coming out. And what's their development platform going to be? Would you expect from the world's, one of the world's most popular web companies? HTML5 and JavaScript, right? HTML5 and JavaScript. Hmm. I see kind of a theme here, HTML5 and JavaScript. Okay. There are, there's always people in the audience that are developers that are like, well, I love JavaScript. Would you stop bashing it? You know, we're not bashing it, right? But we are talking about the fact, you know, that there are some security, um, some security measures that we need to keep in mind when we are using these various technologies. Okay, so PhoneGap had been brought up. And again, PhoneGap is definitely, it, they build themselves is building native mobile applications using HTML, CSS and JavaScript, right? So sounds great. Um, one, <laughs> they they actually recommend some very interesting things on their website. So one of the things, not to jump ahead on my own slides, but there was one thing that I read which was very interesting. Um, in the questions and answers section, people said, "Hey, well, I'm concerned writing my applications in JavaScript because anybody can go to the App Store, take it, decompile it, and see my JavaScript." Right? What are we going to do? Well, first of all, it's not exactly like unique to this, to this environment, but their official response was, hey, no problem, just when the application starts up, go ahead and dynamically download your JavaScript and then run it that way, right? Anything that could go wrong in that scenario, you start up a phone that has basically a, J, a JavaScript wrapper that you can invoke native phone APIs and they tell you to go out to the web, grab some JavaScript, pull it down, and then execute it on the phone. Well, cross-site scripting all of a sudden has a totally different meaning in this context. And if you're going over a non-HTTPS connection, anybody might be able to intercept and modify that, that code that's coming down to your phone. Obviously, that could lead to some very traumatic results. So just one of the various things. By the way, app stores come up. This is also a, set, a source of confusion for a lot of C-level folks and, and normal consumers. They say, well, I got it in the app store. It's got to be safe, right? So what are the security checks that are being done, for example, in the Android uh, app store? <laughs> there we go. Yeah, is there any? Um, I don't believe so, right? I think there might be some cursory um, static code analysis checks, but clearly there is malware that is rife in these various app stores. What about um, Apple? The secret sauce, right? So uh, you would think, but then of course there's been research that shows that you can get various code and, and, and so forth into these uh, various uh, applications. And just the fact that we talked about before with PhoneGap, if you're downloading code dynamically, 
JavaScript code, for example, from a remote server, pulling it down to a device and then running it, there is no opportunity for any app store, even if they were doing security checks, to catch something like that because the code is downloaded at runtime. So far so good? You guys all feeling okay? You guys are looking a little bit depressed, right? This is getting a little bit depressing. Jim. Oh, well, that's a good question. Yeah, probably scrutiny, right? So when you submit an application on Android, how long does it usually take to get up there? Instant. iOS? Like weeks if you're lucky. Does that mean that they're doing anything really differently? <laughs> Not necessarily. Not necessarily, right? Not necessarily. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I don't have an easy answer for that one. But yeah, clearly with the Android store, there's like rife with malware and everything else. Seems to be less on the, and, on the iOS store, unless we're all just living in a delusion and there's like malware everywhere and we just don't know about it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a good question. Well, yeah, so then you might say, so once again, Apple may perhaps sign that particular certificate. Does that mean that you can't put malware there, in, uh, malware there store? No, but they can turn it off. Paco. Right. 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 Yeah, but the only counter to that, I mean, the only thing I would argue just simply is if I have a stolen credit card, I can make an Apple ID account and then there, there's no traceability. I mean, there's no traceability to me potentially. If I'm going to download the Coca-Cola app, uh -huh. I have some real high confidence that the one that's labeled Coca-Cola in the Apple app store can genuinely take Coca-Cola. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. Yeah, so there's, some, there's at least some semblance of uh, repudiation or with authentic authenticity of a particular application. Yeah, very good point. However, though, I mean, I guess the counterpoint might simply just be games and things like that. I mean, you just download any random app in the in the Android store. Like, you guys ever gone to the Android store? You download some weird app, like you know, whatever it happens to be, just some bizarre app, and they're like asking for like 50 different permissions. Like, hey, I'm going to access your phone. I'm going to access your pictures. I'm going to ask this, access this and that. Um, and a lot of that is malware. So even with, with maybe potentially uh, high target code that would be like Coca-Cola and stuff like that, there's still a bunch of weird malware. So yeah, it's kind of a, it's a strange, it's a strange world that we live in. Um, Apple iTunes does, does search obviously for banned applications, for pirated applications, um, things like that. There are a few that make it through every once in a while. There was uh, somebody who put a MAME emulator. You guys all familiar with MAME? Yeah, they put a MAME emulator inside of a game called Gridly, and then they put it into the App Store. And if you knew exactly where to put your ROMs, then you could essentially have MAME running on your jailbroken iPhone. So it was kind of cool. OK, so we've kind of gone through the basics. Um, we've talked about what's all on the client side. You guys, hopefully, if you're here, should be very familiar with the server side, right? So what languages now exist on the server side, or what technologies do we use to build server side applications? Everything. Right, Java, .NET, PHP, Python, Ruby, um, Go. What's that? JavaScript. JavaScript, right? If you're using Node, um, Swift. I don't know if they have Swift on the server side yet. Yeah, but who knows? You never know, right? That could be a job description, um, and then you know, Perl potentially. So the main question then really is, you know, is mobile secure? The word secure and the word risk are like some of the most misunderstood words that I hear here at OWASP, right? Even people who live and breathe this stuff, it's like secure, risk, this, that. You know, and we all kind of like look at a different piece of the puzzle. So I'm going to take this from the perspective of the developer, right? I'm writing a, an application. What are the things that I need to watch, watch out for when I'm building my application? If you do cursory research, if you go to Google, you type in mobile security, what do you think one of the first links you're going to hit is going to be? It's probably going to be OWASP. And I have, well, probably above that, you might have like the Apple Developer's Guide. You might have this. But yeah, so let's talk about OWASP. What is OWASP, what, what are its offerings to the world as far as mobile security? Mobile top 10. Mobile top 10. Mobile top 10 processors. Um, there's the jailbreaking guide. 
Mm -hmm. There's uh, lots, of, lots of guides in a variety of different places. Right. Right. So let's let's stick with the first one. So like the mobile developers, the mobile, the top ten mobile guide, right? That's from, that's from the European Foundation called Lisa. Okay. Who actually donated that to the OS Foundation. So you know what usually makes me doubt lists? That all of these like major risks we are all supposed to watch out for, like coincidentally always come in ten, right? <laughs> There's always these like ten, 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 ten. Uh, does that mean if you download this list, and again, there are people who base their entire security programs off of top ten lists which is not something I'm a big fan of. If you're a developer and you go download the mobile top 10, I mean, is it a good thing to follow all 10 of those rules? What do you guys think? Again, you are security fundamentalists, so keep that in mind. But what do you think? It's impossible to say without knowing the risk profile of the, of the, of the department, of the company, of everything else. What is their risk appetite? Right? You might say, well, we want to code and make sure it's absolutely perfectly unhackable, it's completely safe, Whatever. Is that possible? No, right? It's not possible. Even if it is possible, if you have to spend a ton of money and time and effort doing it, when you're, maybe the, the customer who ordered the application doesn't even have a really big security concern, you're wasting their money. You're wasting their time. You're wasting their competitive advantage. Conversely, sometimes you might be building a, a, an application and the top 10 is not sufficient, right? I used to do a lot of consulting for quasi-governmental agencies on the mobile side, and they had extreme restrictions on mobile applications, and therefore a top 10 list would not be sufficient. Sound reasonable to everybody? Sounds like it's common sense, but you would have no idea how many people are like, you've got to follow exactly these top 10, as if it's like some magic, you know, scientifically crafted number of, of applications. It's not. It's a bunch of guys getting around saying, okay, just pull up some, you know, what are these things? Or maybe there's some data to back it up, but a lot of it is, you know, guesswork. Okay, so um, again, this is kind of the breakdown, web and mobile, uh, blah, blah, blah. Main points. So when it comes to getting started with mobile security, forget about top 10, forget about this and that. You know, I hear people in the hallway saying, yeah, my, you know, I just started a mobile application. The first thing I got to put in there is, you know, anti-jailbreaking code or, you know, this or that. Stop. Focus, first of all, in my opinion, on these three things. These are the three things that are most important for developers to really understand. And they're pretty straightforward. Insufficient transport layer protection. I think we all know what that is, but I'm going to get into it. Unsafe data storage on the device, right, which is uh, probably one of the things that actually gets the most press when, it, when companies get this wrong. And then business logic on the device, right? So this is, you know, pretty much the same subset of issues that also affect quite a bit of number of web applications. So first of all, insufficient transport layer protection. You guys know that most secure data should cross over the internet using what? HTTPS, right? TLS, hopefully, right? Um, what, about in the web, what about in the mobile world? Do you think that that's true? Do you think most of your secure data is going over secure connections? How do you guys know? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You always get these sprinkling in the news, like every couple of weeks. It's like, you know, this application was sending my private data over an insecure connection, or this one was sending my private data over an insecure connection. Is it really that hard to s transport data over, over TLS? No, but it's just for some reason. So again, before you jump right to the anti-jailbreaking code and you know, all these other kind of things that potentially in some environments would be helpful, why don't we get this straight, right, to begin with? Um, you had mentioned Pineapple. Let me throw out another tool. How about Zap, right? So I use Zap regularly in order to inspect mobile applications. Um, how would one do this? How does one use Zap with, for example, my, taking a look at the data that's leaving an iPhone application? A proxy, right? So you just make sure you're on the same network. You, there are proxy settings within, for example, iOS and Android, where you can say, hey, use this as my web proxy. Uh, you can run Zap at a particular port, and now you can see all the data that's leaving or entering 
uh, over HTTP or HTTPS, your device. Has anybody ever done this before? What? Just two people? Three? Okay, five. okay, good. You're like, yeah, I, I thought about it once, right? So, <laughs> yeah, it's extremely enlightening when you start to see all the data uh, and all the requests that these applications are making. You see all the way they're spying on you. You can see the third parties that are being invoked. You can see the advertisements. You can see all this kind of stuff. I'm sorry? It's just best not to know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> Let's add some JavaScript so we can track various users and this is not right, yeah. Okay, so yeah, this is a fun uh, exercise. If you guys haven't done this before, I, di I directly recommend, since only a handful of people have apparently have done this, I mean, for me, it's like, how could you not do this, right? I mean, you've got this device that contains, contains all your most sensitive data. Don't you want to see what it's sending back and forth? Maybe you are right. Sometimes it's better not to know, but, you know, I think some people just like to know. So, interestingly enough, certain applications will reject. Now, now if, you, if you go through a proxy, what should happen with an HTTPS connection? What would happen in a browser? Yeah, it says warning, right? The following connection cannot be, you know, insured. You know, you click more data. The certificate is not valid, etc. What should happen on the i uh, on the mobile device? Same basic thing, right? Allow you to click through, or maybe even block, right? So, what do you think? Does that actually happen? It depends on the application, right? IOS, uh, in, in the case of iOS, they'll actually pop up a message saying, hey, warning, the certificate's not valid, right? Which could put your confidential information at risk. There's not even an OK or cancel. It's pretty much OK, right? And it goes through. Um, <laughs> Well, what's, but, but remember, though, this is not Safari. This is not Safari. It, this, I mean, this is a thick client application. Yeah, sorry about that. These are th I should have mentioned that. You know, these are thick client applications. They might use web components underneath, right? Like, you know, I believe, actually, to be honest, I believe this particular one uses, uh, I'm, yeah, let's not, whatever. So, um, uh, yeah, these are thick client applications, but in this case, it says this. In this case, they actually just bomb you out. They say, hey, I can't make a, a, secure, a secure connection. So when we talk about, you know, transporting data over a secure connection, remember, um, if you're not using a browser, you can't depend on those Chrome error messages and things like that popping up. Your code has to be able to handle these various, um, these various uh, situations. Sound reasonable? Has anybody ever put stuff like this in their code? Like basically, if you can't have a secure HTTPS connection, you bomb them out? Oh, good. Hey, I love you guys. Yeah, that's good. Good. It, it might, to be honest though, it might not be necessary. It might not, right? Let's say this is just like, um, you know, just a catalog where you're just reading, you know, some basic data. <laughs> Depending on the application, you could actually argue that it's not pertinent or it, or it is, right? However, if these guys use any um, web technologies, I would argue that everything should go over HTTPS because of the fact that JavaScript can be injected and it's being inj injected potentially into device where the harm can be much greater than in normal situations. Okay, what is this again? Oh yeah, PayPal. This was, um, this was an interesting CVE. Did anybody read this one? PayPal remote code execution. Essentially, they were grabbing JavaScript libraries uh, over a non-HTTPS connection. I don't know. I mean, is that really worth its own CVE? I mean, it's like everybody in the world does this, right? So I'm not quite sure why they got their own CVE for that. But uh, and it was inside the PayPal application, so maybe the severity of the application was part of that reason. <coughs> okay, so this is the code, and this is all going to be publicly available. But you know, these are the, the types of code that you want to have in there in order to do these types of checks and and so forth when it comes to uh, uh, verifying that you have an uninterrupted HTTPS connection. Phone gap, oh, this is that little, that little blurb I told you guys about earlier. Reverse engineering is a concern of many people that use phone gap since one can simply open the application binary and look at the JavaScript source of an application, which you absolutely can't do in any other technology, right? I mean, that's, what? Okay. Um, 
And so it just says basically it's easier to decompile than Java ob Objective-C. Yeah, I mean, JAD is so difficult, right? And we can figure it out. Um, PhoneGap can get around this since the developers can download JavaScript in their application at runtime. Again, that's sometimes even following like the advice that's on the uh, mobile technology platforms are not perfectly designed for security. So again, you know, make sure that you look at these things from a skeptical perspective. Mm -hmm. it's a very well, so it's an interesting thing that you'd bring up then about that one particular, Jim. Um, you could actually argue, depending on the application, right? That again, th this is, the, I guess, the, the main thing in the security world that um, we all, you know, this thing that we all seem to fall into. People seem to either be on one side, like, yeah, we, it's absolutely snake oil, or on the other side, which is you absolutely have to have it in every time. But there's no other field that's really like that, right? Everything is situational, everything is gradient, everything is based on, you know, risk. You know, one of the things lately that I've also been talking a lot about is risk-based approach. Have any, has anybody in here heard of risk-based approach? It's essentially when you have a whole bunch of vulnerabilities, right? A, se a severe in one application is not equivalent to the severe in another application because the applications themselves are of different values. Does that make sense? So being able to actually take every vulnerability and reduce it down to a common score, which we do usually in dollars and cents or euros and cents or pounds and cents, you know, put into a tangible um, score so that way, uh, you know, stakeholders and security engineers can be speaking the same language. And the same thing goes with like security controls. There's always gradients. Okay, unsafe data storage on the device. Unsafe data storage on the device. This is the one thing that gets a lot of people. <coughs> there are so many different ways to store data on a particular device, right? So a lot of the times, you, you know that you have SQLite databases that you can access. When you open up a browser, it's got SQLite databases. Depending on the device, you might have an SD card, you might have memory, you might have file system where you can store particular files. Um, you might have various, various calls within the device itself where you can store data in keychains and so forth. So data can actually be polluted all over a particular device, right? Um, what's the main rule about storing data on a device, do you think? Don't do it, right? Again, situational, right? Definitely situational. Uh, sometimes you can't help it. Like a phone application, I'm sorry, a, a camera application has to store data on the device, right? You can't, I guess you could maybe upload every single picture to the cloud, but that's not really realistic. But we have to define what data we're talking about, right? So like a first name, right? or maybe a preference of like, do you want to get, receive ads or not? That might be one classification. A password might be something totally different. But I think the, key, the thing to keep in mind is mobile devices have a higher frequency of being lost than probably your average, your average computer. Would you guys agree with that or not? So there's a slightly larger risk in this data getting lost, which is why storing sensitive data on the device is, is not right. But if you look at the number of laptops that are actually lost, in a given year. I think it was something like 400,000 in airports alone every single year that are left behind. And those definitely have sensitive data. So it's kind of a murky issue. You will hear fundamentalists on each side. You, know, you will hear people who feel very, very strongly. But at the end of the day, it all depends on the risk tolerance of your organization. But yeah, I would agree. The rule of thumb is don't store sensitive data on this device uh, impermanently. And here's why. Has anybody whipped out a, a tool called iFunbox? Okay, this is your homework assignment for those of you who haven't, right? Pull out iPhone phone box against a non-jailbroken device, plug it in, and take a look at throughout the different file systems, all the different files their applications are storing. It's sometimes very enlightening as to what's actually being written by these applications out onto the, onto the file system. All right, as far as iPhone storage, uh, again, these are just simply code showing where various text and uh, strings can be stored. You've got, for example, the iPhone file store. You've got the um, iOS user defaults data store. 
and the iOS keychain. This is just using iOS as an example of all the different places. If you're doing, for example, an assessment on an application, um, be aware that these are all places the data can lurk. And then plist. And then logs, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. They're taking a screenshot of your yep. application to be background it. Yep. So imagine like being in an app with sensitive data and you background it. Yep. You just dump that to a plain text file. Yeah, no, I would agree. It's but so out of control how many places you release your point. Oh, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. That one particular case in point though, again, just to make sure everybody heard what Jim said, when you switch tasks in a mobile phone, it actually takes a screenshot of whatever you're on. And you guys have seen this before, right? Like you're going from like one tab to another and you can see it's like outdated, then you bring it to the forefront, the application runs, and then the screen is updated. Theory, it used to be that those particular screenshots could get written to the disk, and therefore if you lost your phone, somebody found it. If you just happened to be like on a screen that was showing sensitive data like your bank balance, right, when you switch tasks, then that would leak out, right? I would agree, however, again, think about you know, the data that we're talking about. If it's a banking application, if it's a government application, then that might be a valid concern that we need to fight against. Um, but yeah, it's, to Jim's point, data just leaks out everywhere. However, Apple has a solution for this, right? Which is, hey, you know, store all sensitive data in our cloud, right? So <laughs> they basically say you can store your passwords in our cloud, your contacts, your calendars, your reminders. It's almost like you might have already given up, right? You're like, well, all my stuff is already in Google. Might as well give it to Apple as well. I'm like, you know, who, who cares at this point, right? But uh, nevertheless, it's not something that I feel securely doing. But it is, it is something that instead of storing it on the device, developers have at their disposal. OK, last little point here. And by the way, does anybody have a, I should check the time, 15. Oh, crap. OK. I think I'm on slide 20 of like 76 or something, but uh, we'll, we'll go through quickly. So business logic on the phone and direct object references. This is a biggie. This is what we find all the time. First of all, is it hard to decompile mobile applications? No, no, it's extremely easy, right? Uh, when it comes to iOS, there's a little bit more work than when it comes to Android. Android, for example, just to use that as an example, you download the DEX file, you essentially can make a jar file out of it by, I think, renaming it, right? And then it's done. Um, and then you can run it through, or you can run it through dex to jar, I'm sorry, to get to the jar file. And then from the jar file, you can decompile it using JAD. Whole process takes, what, 30 seconds, right? And then you can see, basically, just like this in plain text, pretty much all the job that goes into these particular applications. Has anybody ever done this before? This is a fun thing to do on the weekends. I don't know about your weekends. <laughs> Okay, but this is what I find to be very fun. So you can find it like the credit card processing information. You can find developer, sometimes you can find all sorts of like crazy comments even, crazy method names. I found very offensive stuff and some very well-known uh, like top 50 mobile applications that would just mortify them if that ever came out. Fortunately, journalists don't have a tendency to start looking through you know, jar files, but nevertheless, you can find all sorts of really interesting goodies just by doing this very simple process. So the idea that somehow, the reason why I'm telling you this, you're like, I already know this, but the reason why I'm mentioning this is because developers, when they're coding, tend to put the blinders on and think somehow that, that code is not going to be looked at, that code can't be tampered with. We already know the connection can be tampered with. The code obviously is right there. This is also what causes the issues on the Android store where people take the code, they just simply recompile it, they upload it, they put some changes in it, and now you've got a lot of pollution in the, uh, in the app store. Okay. And then of course, direct object references. Hopefully everybody is familiar with what this term means. Is everybody, I, know, I hate to ask these questions because nobody will say like, I don't know what it is. It's all it is is access control. It's when you take some value from the client, from an untrusted client, that you use on the server side potentially to make some kind of access control decision exclusively. Um, it, this is a piece of cake. Like I said before, when you put up Zap and, and so forth, you can do direct object reference all day, right? You can look at the exact, all the code that's running on the, on the client side. You can see the messages it's sending back to the server. You can make modifications to these particular files. Uh, you can win in games all day, right? Has anybody ever done this, cheated in an, a, a mobile game just by changing the, uh, the data that's being passed and forth? No, Gary, no. No, never, never. <laughs> never. 
Yeah, all right. Anyway, just as a trivia question, what game is this from? Anybody know? You guys are disappointing me. No, no, no. That's the original Nintendo Wrestling, right? That's from like, yeah, very disappointing, you guys. All right. <laughs> so one of the, the areas we find this a lot, for example, in the P list, have you guys ever, this is like actual code that we've seen, like is paid. You can change it from false to true or just change that value. The application now behaves extremely differently. Uh, we, we, and we see this just all over the place. Developers, especially when they're getting in the mindset of building mobile applications, they feel like they're building thick client or server applications. They have direct object references. But again, that's untrusted area. You can't trust that data that's on the client. Okay, so hopefully, you know, we've gone through these three things that are kind of prevalent. There's, a, there's many more things that could potentially happen, but for your, you know, your developer just starting out, those three things will pretty much get you through, you know, some base level of security. Can you say the same thing about the website? No, there's a lot more things that can actually go wrong. So just to very quickly enumerate them, injection attacks. So you've got SQL injection. That is something that is much more likely to happen on the server side than on the client side. Would you guys agree with that? No? Uh-huh. Attack code over to the server? But where does the SQL injection happen in this scenario? No. Where does the SQL injection happen? It doesn't happen in the proxy. It happens on the server, right? So that's what I'm saying. You're agreeing with me. It's more likely to, right? It's, it happens on the server, right? It doesn't happen on the client. It might originate on the client, but to be honest, that's not the client's fault. That's the database code is screwed up, right? So, I mean, it doesn't matter what you send from the client. You have to assume all that data is going to be untrusted. It's the, it's the vulnerabilities on the server side. Right? This is the main point. I'm glad you brought this up. The main point is when you're starting to look at, you know, a mobile application consists of code that's running on a device and it's running on a server, the code on the server side can screw you up a lot harder than the code on the client side. But yet people seem to be putting all their attention onto the client side as opposed to the server side. Okay. Must have been mobile developers. They're like, nah, I don't want to hear about that, right? All right. <laughs> Okay, so again, you guys get all the picture on how everybody knows how SQL injection works, hopefully. And even if you don't, I don't have enough time to explain it. Broken authentication and session management. Is this something that we have to worry about on the client side or the server side? On the server, right? Yeah, you might have controls for authentication and access, uh, authentication session management on the client. It might pass credentials. It even might do something dumb like, you know, store a remember me cookie on the device, right? But that's actually small potatoes compared to other things that can happen on the server side. Now, the, the, the caveat to that, by the way, is don't store passwords on that device. It should go without saying, but of course, this happened earlier this year, right? January 16th, unfortunately, a very slow news week for the media, and it came out, some security researcher came out and said, hey, I found unencrypted passwords stored in plain text on, on a Starbucks app. Who cares, right? I mean, we find this like 50 times a day, right, in various applications. But this, for some reason, caught fire. It was like, you know, people are going to be drinking our lattes, and it's horrible, and our passwords are all out and everything. But what is the maximum damage that this could have done? If you lost, I mean, think about the threat model. You lose your phone, somebody finds it, they hook it up to iPhone Boxy, they dig around in the file system, they find your unencrypted password, they can access your Starbucks account. Oh, no. Yeah, they got everything else, right? Like, oh, well, you know, they got, yeah, they got my email, they got my mail, they got everything but my Starbucks, right? <laughs> the universe, universal karma. <laughs> right. But, but I had to point this out because I don't know if you guys remember, this was just earlier this year. This did not leave the national headlines for like three days. Like you kept going back to CNN or whatever you read, and it, like BBC, and it's like Starbucks. How could they have done this, right? And again, it's not it's huge deal, but they were storing sensitive data, obviously passwords, on the device. It's semi-related authentication, so I put it in here. Okay, um, and then finally, cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is everybody at OWASP's favorite topic, right? It's that perennial cockroach that never seems to go away. Um, 
you know, it's, it's just, that's the way it is. Is it as significant in web applications as it is in mobile applications? I would argue it's probably a lot harder to get cross-site scripting to pop on a mobile device than on a normal web application. That said, if you are using something like PhoneGap, right, there is the potential for being disastrous if you could actually get it to pop. But for the most part, just for the fact that you've got this wide variety and collection of languages, um, the average, for the average developer, this is not something that, um, you know, is potentially going to make or break the security in your particular application. All right, let me just get through all this dumb animation stuff. By the way, this is all from my tutorial series, so this is like from the, uh, from that YouTube stuff I was talking about. Okay, now more of this. What is this one? Insecure direct object reference. Again, we already talked about this. Any type of value on the phone can be modified. Somebody using a proxy, send back to the server. You cannot trust the data that's coming in from the client side, even if it is a mobile application. I think developers are finally starting to realize, realize this with web applications, but it's, it seems to be rife in mobile applications. Okay, and then finally, one last thing, I believe, security misconfiguration. This is an issue that happens on both sides, okay? Misconfiguring the security settings on your application, that's something that both on the client side and the server side can affect them, I would say, to much more disastrous results on the server side. All right, since we're running out of time, I'm just gonna skip, skip, skip. And then finally, if you kind of look down the issues as opposed to like out of the OWASP top 10, what can go really wrong on the client, what can go really wrong on the server, the way that I tallied it, the server deserves a lot more attention. So if we go back to our original hypothesis of where should you put your time and your money and more resources, hopefully you guys see it's, I'm sorry, but we're still not out of the woods yet. You know, you can't just jump to the fun stuff and start doing mobile security unless you have a secure server on the back. <coughs> One last thing for more resources, even though I kind of bashed it throughout this talk, there's the mobile top 10, not really bashed it, but uh, you know, just basically letting you know you don't have to follow each and every one of these things. There's the iOS developer cheat sheet. Jim Manico is the product manager of the cheat sheet series, phenomenal resource, uh, worldwide renowned. There is an iOS developer cheat sheet, uh, mobile, breaking jail, uh, mobile jailbreaking cheat sheet, and of course, you can also go to, and you can go to Google itself uh, there's an Android secure development uh, documentation, and the same thing with Apple. That's it. That's it, guys. <laughs> How much time do we have for questions? We've got five minutes. All right. If you guys want to ask any questions, feel free. Just stick your hand up and bring the microphone up if it works. Sure, do your thing. No questions? All right. I love you all. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. All right. Sounds good. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I sometimes you don't know. I've been bored to death, tears, or whatever. But I usually don't. I don't walk into my talks assuming that everybody.